Hey, welcome back. It's been a while since our last podcast. This is the Trauma Anesthesiologist Society's podcast. Today, we are excited to present our now recurring episode. This is the second time we've done this on major papers in trauma from the last year, 2021. We'll be considering four papers that were identified with the help of the librarians at the University of Florida. Uh, these were the highest cited papers related to trauma and published in the calendar year of 2021. We focused on primary research studies. Yeah, I just wanted to put out acknowledgement. Thank you, uh, Mary Edwards, for your help with, with finding these papers. Uh, 2021 was a pretty big year for traumatic brain uh, research, uh, which is pretty exciting, especially if you guys uh, saw our last conference uh, webinar we had in Chicago. Uh, we are considering three papers related to traumatic brain injuries, and then one paper about injuries from standing electric scooters. Uh, the format is the same as last year. Kevin will introduce the papers, and one of our guests will comment on it for about one minute. Uh, not a second more. And our second guest will have 30 seconds for additional comment. Our panelists this year are uh, Dr. Justin Richards from uh, Shock Trauma at the University of Maryland and Dr. Jerry Jones from the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. Thank you both for joining us. Let's begin. Um, so the first paper is titled Fibrinolytic Activation in Patients with Progressive Intracranial Hemorrhage After Traumatic Brain Injury from the Journal of Neurotrauma uh, by Fair and colleagues. The authors explored whether patients with progressive intracranial hemorrhage after traumatic injury exhibited a coagulopathic or fibrinolytic state based on coagulation lab testing and TEG. 71 of 140 enrolled patients met criteria for progressive injury. They found that elevated D-dimer was associated with progressive injury, but not other lab tests. Inferring that D-dimer is a marker of fibrinolysis, they also therefore infer that fibrinolysis is a cause of progressive traumatic brain injury. So Dr. Jones, you have one minute. Okay. Keep in mind that uh, a number of other studies have also pointed to the real coagulopathy smoking gun that's linked to progression, uh, and progression was also associated with higher ISS and uh, uh, decreased uh, GCS, you must suspect. Uh, but if we can uh, believe what we see here, um, they have a couple of important, there's a couple of important points. Uh, one, they said that D-dimer on admission, not six hours or 24 hours later, was what really tips us off. And... TEG may be relatively insensitive in uh, recognizing uh, hyperfibrinolysis, and, you know, TEG was their primary uh, evaluation point. So this means a couple of good things. One, you know, have a high index of suspicion with, you know, uh, severely injured patients, um, and two, look in the right place, which they're suggesting, again, is an initial D-dimer, and the fact is we can get this information relatively quick. And in this particular circumstance, the, the great thing is it actually points to a meaningful therapy, meaning, you know, TXA, which is doing uh, CRASH-2 and some other studies to uh, mitigate uh, progression without, uh, you know, adverse or serious adverse effects. So at worst, uh, this could be another thing in your arsenal to, if you're trying to consider using TXA or not. Uh, Dr. Richard, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with Dr. Jones in, in a lot of the, the comments he made, specifically kind of starting out from the beginning and that we know there's some uh, markers that are associated with worse progression of, uh, of traumatic brain injury, specifically that of depth of shock and severity of coagulopathy. And I think what's important to look at in the results and how they did their analysis is that the patients who had progression were significantly more severely injured with a higher ISS. Uh, but there was no difference in their head abbreviated injury scale score, no difference in their systolic blood pressure. What would be helpful to know is what was the difference in the severity of shock? Again, things we know that can lead to worsened brain injury, the acidemia uh, and the coagulopathy. So I think this is very interesting information, knowing that patients progress because of certain characteristics. I'm not entirely convinced it's the fibrinolysis because we know that fibrinolysis, based on the work out of Oregon uh, and many other places, the fibrinolysis... Uh, is associated with worse coagulopathy and worse depth of shock. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple things that I noticed. Uh, first, the first thing I noticed was this was from uh, Kevin Blaine's home institution, and so I wanted to give props there. I like the inclusion criteria, adults, isolated traumatic brain injury. Uh, a lot of the exclusion criteria I thought made sense, but they excluded warfarin, uh, um, and known coagulation disorders. I mean, 
I think that'd be a very interesting subgroup analysis. And there's so many patients at my institution that come with those things that um, I think they would be included to, important to keep that included. Um, statistically, I was hoping Kevin would comment on this. I saw they did a Bonferroni correction, which I really like, but they did a linear regression. And I thought linear regression, you had to uh, assume that the variables were independent um, and linearly related. Uh, yeah, I think you're correct. Uh, that's how you would do the test. I, the, the, uh, in this case, I don't know. I, I think statistically you can make that assumption. Um, I think I, that, that yeah, many of us would probably argue that if you have a fibrinolytic process going on, you'd expect to see multiple changes. So like maybe clinically you wouldn't see that. But from a statistical standpoint, if you think of it as a computer, you're just putting numbers into the machine. And the computer doesn't necessarily assume a math for, for, for this type of analysis isn't going to assume a mathematical relationship between say D dimer and the, the LY 30 time on the tag. Just, I know lin the uh, INR is not a linear relationship. So, um, I just think that's, well, you know, that's one of my pet peeve is that with, with actually most of the, co uh, most of the coagulation times. And, and I mean, this like, not just, you know, the INR, which is based on the pro time, but like uh, most of the tag measurements measured in times, Rotem measured in times, the PTT measured in times. Anything associated with the time doesn't have a linear correlation with factor levels. It's actually got an exponential correlation with factor levels and a one-sided exponential correlation with factor levels. So um, what they're doing is fairly typical for how people usually statistically analyze this type of data. Um, but the fact that they're not seeing a result with that type of analysis doesn't necessarily mean a result isn't there and that, and that another approach, probably a more statistically viable one, would be to take a logarithm uh, of those numbers. Um, but, but they didn't do that here, and, and I would actually hazard a guess that most people probably wouldn't do that kind of statistical analysis. All right, that, that's all I had. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, like... Uh, I thought it was interesting that the only thing that they found was this D dimer. The only, the strongest thing that they found was this D dimer. I kind of struggle with that because if I, uh, you know, the D dimer to me is sort of just one test. And so, uh, I could send any number of tests, but if this one test comes back, uh, should I do anything different? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, if I'm looking at crash, uh, I would probably just give TXA to everybody regardless of the D dimer. Um, I don't know. Do you think I should be holding my D my TXA? Anybody? Oh, well, I, I struggled with it because in medical school, I was taught the D-dimer was trash, that the elevated D-dimer had like over 150 diagnoses on your differential diagnosis. To, to Josh's comment, I mean, and to answer your question, Kevin, I think to Josh's comment about all the different diagnoses, I'm, I'm wondering, is the elevated D-dimer just because these patients were more severely injured? Uh, I mean, at least that's what the, the trend and association were kind of saying. It'd be great to see if, if, again, there was depth of shock information on these folks because uh to give txa or not just based on the d dimer um uh, no in my opinion i think you need to be looking at other things and specifically in these patients i think you need to be looking at other injury sites so that's the, the takeaway is um these folks with progression also seem to be more severely injured and it likely wasn't in their head yeah that that all sounds uh sounds pretty good um so our next article is an article from the journal of neurosurgical anesthesiology titled patient specific icp Epidemiologic Thresholds in Adult Traumatic Brain Injury, a Center TBI Validation Study. Uh, I'm, I'm going to admit right at the beginning that I struggled to understand this one. This was really hard for me. The authors are interested in defining ICP thresholds using something called a pressure reactivity index. Uh, the authors derived uh, a threshold using a complex methodology that they say had been uh, defined in previous papers. The authors analyzed data from the Collaborative European Neurotrauma Effectiveness Research Center in TBI, uh, which is, comes down to the acronym Center TBI uh, uh, study cohort. For 128 patients, they determined if those patients had met a 20, 22, uh, millimeter mercury or a quote derived individualized ICP threshold. They mathematically computed the time above this threshold and compared that time uh, to six and 12 months functional outcomes after discharge. They found that the time above the derived threshold was better associated with mortality than the time above the 22 or 20 millimeter mercury arbitrary thresholds. But there was no difference in functional outcomes, so the primary endpoints were negative. I'm glad to hear that someone else had struggled with this paper. I had to read it a few times. Uh, I believe, Dr. Richards, you are first. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to uh, hear that. I think we're all on the same page in terms of uh, struggling to, to kind of piece this all together. I applaud them with how much data and, and what they were able to do with a lot of this kind of continuously uh, collected vital signs or, or monitoring data. In fact, looking at the, the results, I think one of the most helpful things to take away, or at least that I take away, is not looking at the population that they studied, but the population that they actually excluded, which were those patients that had no identifiable individual intracranial pressure threshold. And in fact, if you go down in, uh, in table one of the manuscript, but you look at the, um, the patients who had that not, no identifiable ICP threshold, and you looked at their ICP, it was significantly higher than those patients in whom they were able to, to calculate this threshold. And they also had no difference in their mean arterial pressure. And so piecing this together from just a pathophysiologic standpoint, it's kind of suggesting these patients who they were not studying, but I think a very important patient population, the ones who lose their cerebral autoreactivity. And further down in the results, these patients who actually were not really studied in the results, but they were more severely injured. They had worse uh, Glasgow outcome uh, skill scores, um, uh, on discharge, and fewer of them were alive at six to 12 months, and not necessarily surprising, but these were over um, a third of their overall kind of included population. They actually excluded because Justin, of a lack of IC. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, Justin, but that, that was uh, time. Um, That's all I have to say. I think they're looking <laughs> at the wrong population. Uh, Jerry, your thoughts? Right. So, one, uh, uh, well done, Dr. Richards. That is a lot to try to say in a, in a very short period of time. But uh, honestly, uh, I, I think this is an in, intriguing uh, eventual thing that we'll get to as we go from uh, sort of random care to protocols to individualized medicine. Uh, it brought up more questions for me than I think it really answered. I, I get that if you're going to use this, you really also have to have a time machine to go back because they calculated over six days. But, you know, for example, is it is it pulse pressure that's going to make a bigger difference? Is it really the, the time above uh, the individualized number, uh, ICP, or is it the absolute pressure for a certain amount of time? Um, and then does the patient really always going to have one ICP number that's the average of all six days or however long they studied them? Some of my initial thoughts. Okay. I, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, for whatever reason, this is the only study we're, we're looking at that's outside the United States. It's from the United Kingdom. And actually, it was part of the European Union before Britain exited. So uh, that was kind of cool. Um, just some ra random trivia there. Um, I saw that they they calculate a PRX score, which they said was in another manuscript, which I really don't like. I really feel like they should have put in this manuscript how they calculate it and what it's related to. I don't like that I have to look something else up. Um, they did univariate logistic regression, which once again, I think assumes a linear relationship. And I'm not sure that anywhere they've proved that these things are linearly related. Um, and also did a little bit of math and it looked like only 54% of all the patients were, they had an automated score for. So I mean, I guess that's better than half. And it sounded like the reason was because some of the thresholds, the, the ICP might be uh, lower. And so they never, uh, had issues with disturbing autoregulation, and then it might be too high. So they never had a period of time when autoregulation was not disturbed. So uh, I just thought those were interesting. Yeah, I, I was really, I don't know, I really struggled with this paper because there's so much going on there. The, the concept that individualized care may, or individualized uh, uh, monitoring may do a better job of predicting outcomes kind of makes a lot of sense to me. But I, I didn't come away feeling like I understood what ICP targets I should be shooting for. Because uh, I, at this point, could not calculate the derived thresholds. Like, I, I don't, maybe someone who's smarter than me can do it. I can't figure out how to calculate that in my, like, clinical practice. So, so if I can't get the number to use, I don't know what to do with the number. Uh, and that might be my, my problem. And, and I don't know how... I, I could believe that different people need a different number. I just don't know how how accurate this number is. But but I am happy that the concept of an individualized number makes sense. Like that that makes sense to me. I think that's the most important. Is that this is a, a neat new thing to look at? But in the end, when you say we only found that one number for sixty five percent of our patients, then 
okay, well, what, I, what do I do with um, that other third? One of the other things yeah. to that specific group of patients, I think you all are, are, are mentioning, and, and this is again part of the study that they included and reported, 128 patients. But if you look at, at the results, the mean ICP in these patients was 13 with a standard deviation of seven. So I would even go so far as to argue is a majority of patients actually had a normal ICP and weren't going to meet the ICP threshold. Right. And, uh, and if you don't have those, I'm sorry, it, if you don't plot those points with higher and higher pressures and higher and higher ICPs, you're not going to be able to get that information. So, you know, either what do you, do you have to expose the patient to a higher pressure to get their ICP to go up to see what the numbers turn out to be or, or the other drop their blood pressure significantly so that you can get data points on the other side of the U-shaped curve uh, to figure out what to do with it. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to our, our third paper, and this is our, our final TBI paper before we get on to our, our paper about electric scooters. So this paper uh, was published in JAMA Neurology. It's titled, Recovery of Consciousness and Functional Outcome in Moderate and Severe Traumatic Brain Injury uh, by Kowalski and colleagues. The authors note that goals of care discussions uh, including things like withdrawal of care, presupposes that patients who have a prolonged wait until they recover their consciousness after a traumatic injury, that that time interval is associated with a worse uh, recovery outcome. The authors sought to test this assumption by using the Traumatic Brain Injury Model Systems National Database. They included 17,470 patients with TBI, 82% of which recovered consciousness. The authors found that most patients with delayed return to consciousness during the hospital stay improved during rehabilitation. The authors conclude by stating that treatment decisions about functional outcomes should be made with caution in TBI patients with delayed return to consciousness. Yeah, so I, I think this is definitely the maybe the feel-good study of the year. Uh, you know, we don't need a lot of information or help with what do I do with this injury that's very minor or it's just catastrophic? It's these, you might call these somewhere in the middle where uh, it, it's a maybe a severe TBI, but you also have this very young, uh, maybe vigorous patient. Now, obviously, not all of them met that criteria, but it's do we continue to fight and go and do uh, when they really may, it's possible that they may just persist without a, a meaningful recovery. Do we really keep going after it and going after it? And uh, again, this was uh, great to see. This study um, probably tells us that we're doing better than uh, we might have thought of we were doing. So, again, everybody who's fighting the good fight in trauma against all odds uh, can kind of give themselves a pat on the back here, I think. Um, I look at this primarily to say when you're counseling family who may, may even be making these decisions, hey, you know, just because they're not awake yet doesn't mean they won't eventually. Um, and then it may be in the whole informed consent process. Yeah, I, I think that was really nicely described by Jerry. And, uh, you know, his, his comment about there are a lot of patients who uh, may not be awake when they get discharged to a rehabilitation center. They can still make a lot of progress over the next year. And I think that's a really important concept uh, in traumatic brain injured patients. Um, I applaud the authors on getting a lot of data over a long period of time. To me, what stuck out were really the last two paragraphs of the results where they talk about some of their changes over the last 30 years. And in fact, patients were getting older and their functional outcomes and their return of consciousness was getting worse. Uh, and I think that's something that we're going to need to pay attention to, certainly as we see more patients who are older coming in with falls um, and, and the impact that's going to have on the traumatic brain injured population. Yeah, that was actually really disturbing for me that they, they did this study over 30 years and broke it down by decade. And each decade, the outcomes got worse and worse, like despite newer technology, better knowledge, uh, standard of care, whatever, people are actually doing worse as time go on, not better. But but is that is that because of the point they do brought it, bring up that uh, Justin also said maybe there's older patients that honestly, maybe a long time ago, 20 some odd years ago, we would have just given up earlier on them. Uh, maybe we're bringing them forward and we're, we might not have done some more of that. And is it also because we're I don't know, sending people to rehab faster or uh, we're taking care of worse and worse things? I, I think the thing that makes it a, a black box that we don't know is we don't know which patients uh, that are not being studied here, you know, the ones that they withdrew care on. Was that, was that population of patients different over time? That might 
I don't know, maybe bring some more, maybe go back to making it sound like a cheerful, positive, happy uh, message. Yeah, that's actually a silver lining. Maybe we're now starting to let people try to recover that we weren't trying before mm -hmm. on. Um, yeah. The other things I noticed about the paper, um, the things they found that were independent for predictor's outcome um, were kind of straightforward. Younger, male was kind of surprising. Less uh, neurologic injuries, less mass effect, no intracranial hemorrhage. Um, I really did like that, that they did over 30 years and could do that at the end. The last thing I want to point out is they um, excluded patients who were chemically sedated or paralyzed at initial presentation. I was thinking that could probably be a large chunk of patients uh, based on my knowledge of, of the this, of traumatic practice. Right. And they didn't really describe that. Pop well, they didn't describe the other patients, too. So, yeah, I, uh, it's it's. It's like I think you guys have all hit the most important point, which is or the, the most important criticism, if it can be a criticism, is we don't know. 17,000 is a lot of people, but we don't know who wasn't in that 17,000. Um, but I'm always heartened when I, you know, when I see things that say, eh, maybe just wait a little bit more, because it's, it's always hard as an intensivist myself. You know, it's, it's always hard, particularly I, actually the more experience I get, the harder it gets to to say, look, we haven't seen a recovery. It's time to, time to, 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 to have a different discussion. And, uh, partly cause you're always kind of doubting yourself. At least that's been my experience. And I see a paper like this and it kind of gratifies that instinct that, well, maybe there's still a chance here. And, you know, it sort of validates continuing to work. Um, so, so I see something like that and, and I think I'm hearing it from you guys too, that it's sort of like our, 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 our therapies do matter. You know, we're not, we're not taking people out of traumas and, and turning them into vegetables. These people go back to, to, to their lives. And I don't know, I guess, I guess I find that to be a, a very enheartening, very, very uh, optimistic finding. I agree. I agree. One of the things that I, uh, I sort of kidded the kid with the trauma surgeons all the time about is them saying like, you know, they got in the door, they went to the emergency surgery and they didn't die. I'm like, that is an important endpoint. Absolutely. They didn't die right there. But what are we leaving these patients with? And a lot of times you don't see it all the way through. So, again, that's how I took this is, hey, if we can just keep them from dying up front and, and move along and do these things we do, we we probably are doing a lot of good for a lot of people. So. OK, let's finish up and get to our final study. Uh, and uh, this is the one I've been uh, very interested in hearing from. Uh, this study by uh, Bloom and colleagues is titled, quote, uh, Standing Electric Scooter Injuries, Impact on a Community. Uh, this is from the American Journal of, Sur of Surgery. Standing electric scooters appeared overnight in many locations. Uh, they're certainly popular in many parts of my town. Uh, the authors are interested in the community burden of injuries from these scooters. They performed a retrospective review of trauma patients who were using scooters at the time of injury over a 10-month period. They also looked at rates of Google searches. They found 248 patients. Most of these patients were adults. More than half patients, half of patients suffered injuries from uh, loss of balance. So they, they lost balance and fell off the scooter. Um, most injuries occurred on the street as opposed to in bike lanes or in sidewalks. And most injuries involved alcohol or marijuana. Only 3% of injured persons wore helmets, although none of them had a TBI. Um, their Google Trends research showed an uptick in, in searches for scooter injuries from July through November during the year of their study period. I'm not sure what to do with that statistic, though. So. Okay, I believe, Justin, the, the board is yours. A little bit of a, a, a fun read, I'll say, kind of a, a cute study. Um, one that I think has some important implications and at least important things to take away. And I'll, I'll say this with a little bit of jest. First takeaway is I'm going to be very careful walking along the sidewalk in Los Angeles um, where they noted that a little less than 20 percent of their patients were injured on the sidewalk, which interestingly was illegal to have these um, motorized scooters on sidewalks. And it seemed to be predominantly from older folks tripping over them. Um some of the other things I think to take away and whether or not it was significantly shown in this study or not, it's debatable. But the fact that so few people wore uh, helmets and this has been a, a larger kind of public health, I think, question in many cities of, of should there be helmet laws for these electric scooters? I know there was a push for that in Nashville, Tennessee, a few years ago. Uh, and the other part is, is the number of folks who are on these scooters who are under the influence of either drugs or alcohol. 
Um, the last thing, and I throw this in there from an anecdotal perspective, but just knowing that these can be kind of higher energy injuries. Uh, we've seen a few folks who've been riding them and they get thrown over. They end up having blunt abdominal trauma because they're hitting the, uh, the, the handlebar. Uh, and, and that cannot, sometimes it's not innocuous and you can have some significant injury. <clears throat> so, um, interesting just description of these. Uh, unfortunately, we may be seeing more and more of these studies in the future. Uh, Jerry, it's your turn. Okay. So I was hoping that this was going to be like, oh, it's a big thing and we, we need to change the world because of the bus. I was going to kind of take a more of a, uh, a devil's advocate uh, position and say, well, let's look at it like this. There's a lot of injuries out there that we're trying to focus money and time and energy and every uh, you know, policies on. The vast majority of these injuries didn't even get admitted. Only 15 percent of them. A lot of them were seen in the clinics and things like that. Uh, the worst injuries were with people that were on drugs and alcohol. And they only said that was about 10 percent, but that was a self-report. And I'd be willing to bet that that number is notably higher. Um, and um, a lot of the injuries were from inappropriate locations, uh, illegal you know, use of drugs, even some that are both younger than uh, than they were supposed to be. So uh, I would say that this is a worthwhile and underappreciated source of injuries. Uh, but it should, you know, keep it in context. Um, and, and I remember when these injuries uh, started happening. I think we, we could talk about what what sort of policies we might uh, want to change with these. I I was blown away about this article. There are so many things that stood out to me as just random trivia that I, I just cannot get over. I mean, first, this study was done in less than a year and they had 248 patients. That means almost one patient a day got injured on one of these things. I mean, that's that just floored me. Six percent of the injuries were people who it was illegal for them to be using the devices because they were so young and nine percent shouldn't be using because of the user agreement and such. Um, I was surprised only 44 percent of these went to trauma centers, that 30 percent went to community hospitals and 19 percent went to orthopedic clinics and 70 went to, uh, seven percent went to urgent clinics. So you were really usually missing a huge chunk of these injuries at the hospitals that we work at. Cause I think every one of us works at a, a trauma center. Mm -hmm. um, the number one reason for people to get injured was loss of balance. Second was a motor vehicle crash. Number three was tripping over it. I, was, <laughs> like, I mean, that's, that's just crazy for me. Um, it looked like they said based on their, their data that, um, there is one injury for every seven searches uh, on Google for these devices. That's like a 14% injury rate. And it sounds like 30 to 40% of the injuries was on the first attempt to use one of these things. I mean, these things are dangerous. Um, it said during uh, one point in time, they were giving out free helmets. And despite giving out free bike helmets, nobody was, nobody was really using them. And that, that's all I really got from this. Yeah, but think about it. So, so that's a good point. And I think it only said like two percent of patients had some a concussion or something that would be a TBI or something like this. But the vast majority, you know, if you're going to do something to help with this, yes, you can make have people wear a helmet. But it sounds like you need wrist guards and shin guard. You know, you need something that you know if you're going to do something impactful, it would be uh, pick, pick some other kind of equipment like that. Um, um, or, or some or of the sobriety test. Yes. Or, you know, the one that you could you could maybe have them say, look, you, you know, you go through the process and your credit card and this and that and the other. But make another thing that says, hey, people get, you know, make something you have to acknowledge, actively acknowledge that hey, you have to be 18. Hey, if you're drunk, you're going to really you more chance of an injury or this could you know, this is fun. But you could, have, you know, something that maybe alerts. You have to do a breath analyzer test before. Yeah. All right. Right. But, you know, you can't get people to not drink and drive. So not drink and scooter. I mean, that's a I, I do think it's probably a, a very much an underappreciated source of traumatic injuries. Um, but, but uh, you know, would the model still work if you said, here's where you go? That, that, that's what the things that people like about it is. Oh, there's one sitting right there. You know, 10 seconds later, I can just buzz along. Uh, if you said, oh, I've got to go to this place and get it. And when I'm done, I got to bring it back to the place. I'm not saying that the business model should be, you know, while we're safe or not, but uh, they may not, uh, you know, have this sort of a process if we uh, if it gets regulated too much. You know, what if we just look at the top speeds? Maybe they cut the top speeds down some or maybe uh, design them a little better. Well, um, we could walk around with proximity alerts or terminator vision. So make sure you don't trip on it when we're walking down the sidewalk. Right. 
It was something else I've, I've remember seeing a few years ago was a study done on the number of, of bicycle accidents, bicycle collisions, and in, in bicycle friendly cities and unfriendly cities. Um, and at least talk about the context of this study. These scooters weren't allowed on the sidewalks. They should be in the street, and presumably they're in bike lanes. Kevin, I don't know if you can confirm, but is Los Angeles a bike friendly city? Because Baltimore sure isn't. Um, and we got people on these in bike lanes and not. And that that's going to be your real, I think, a big challenge is in these biker or scooter unfriendly cities now baltimore is not car friendly it's only car friendly where they did the grand prix <laughs> yeah that's true too i don't know how some of these things are going to deal with the potholes did, did you see that the injury rates or you recall from that study if, if the injury rate i don't know what you figure out the injury rate for bicycles is but uh maybe uh or do, do you you have an impression from what that talked about with the bicycle injuries versus versus these scooters uh, I, I don't recall, and that study was a handful of years ago before the uh, the scooters became uh, more prominent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess about six, seven years ago. Yeah. Well, I I think that's about all we have for all all the studies. You got anything left, Ke- Kevin? No, I think that's it. I uh, thought that was a great discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Jerry Jones and Justin Richards for for being our panelists this. Uh, this podcast and, and thank you again, doc matters for hosting yes thanks so much for having us yeah absolutely thank you and then anyone listening to this if you want to if you're interested in being a future panelist or discussion expert for the trauma anesthesia society uh please email us with the links below <laughs>